From Illinois Public Media, this is The 21st Show. I'm Brian Mackey. It's been two years since the U.S. Supreme Court ended the federal constitutional right to an abortion. Following that decision, known as Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health, state legislatures have restricted access to abortion in many states, particularly in the South. That has made Illinois a magnet for people seeking to end a pregnancy, drawing more than 37,000 women from elsewhere last year, the most of any state. That figure, by the way, is from the pro-abortion rights Guttmacher Institute. We asked our texting group about this. Ginger in Springfield says, I don't mind if women from other states come to Illinois for an abortion. At the same time, federal and state laws need to change. To allow abortion when a woman needs one, the current situation is intolerable, she says. But Lloyd in Danville says, first, let me say I only support abortion if it's medically necessary. Second, given the number of abortions performed, there's no way they are all for reproductive health. You can join the conversation today at 800-222-9455. That's 800-222-9455. Have you or someone you know been affected by the Dobbs decision? What do you think of Illinois' status as a national abortion destination, a haven, as supporters of abortion rights say? How do you think about the future of reproductive rights here? Today we're talking about the post-Dobbs landscape in Illinois and beyond. Joining us for that is Megan J. Ifo, Executive Director of the Chicago Abortion Fund, which helps people travel here to get abortion care. Megan, welcome to the 21st Show. Thank you for being with us. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Let's just begin by talking about, to the extent you can generalize, and I know all people are different people, but who is a typical client for the Chicago Abortion Fund? Um, That's such a great question, and I think it has certainly changed over the last couple of years, Um, probably the last five years since um, we started seeing a wave of bans and restrictions around the Midwest and South um, in May of 2019. Prior to May of 2019, I would have told you that our typical caller um, was based in, in Illinois or perhaps Indiana. Um, and now our typical caller, um, we have supported people in uh, 40 states um, in post stops. Um, the majority of our patients are parents. I think that is something that I always like to stress when I talk about who has abortions. Um, like the majority of people who have abortions, the majority of people who typically call abortion funds are people who are parenting. Um, the majority of our callers are people of color. Many of our callers come from rural communities. Um, Many of our callers are immigrants. We support many young people. Um, I think there is maybe a misconception around, you know, the age of of someone who has an abortion. We see people who um, are into their 40s seeking support with accessing abortion. Um, In Illinois, because we have Medicaid coverage for abortion care here, the majority of our callers uh, from Illinois are actually privately insured, which I think is interesting. We're very grateful to be a state that has Medicaid coverage for abortion, but um, it is often out of reach for people with private insurance due to to expensive co-pays and and other out-of-pocket expenses. Um, So I think that is something people might be surprised by. Um, I I just, I'll stress post-ops, really we're here to support anyone who needs an abortion and have no eligibility requirements or income restrictions with which to do so. So that means we end up supporting people from all walks of life too. What are some of the obstacles people talk about when they call for help? Is it legal, financial, all the above, I'm sure, to some extent? Um, I think it is all of the above. Yeah, I think people certainly need support with paying for their appointments, which is something that we do. And then people need support with all of the wraparound supports associated with getting to their appointment. Um, and then the barriers are many. People are managing a lot of fear and a lot of misinformation right now. Um, so we are helping people, I think, really navigate any barrier that that comes their way, travel is just a huge one at this point. Um, the majority of people who um, we support in Illinois currently are not from Illinois. People are really coming, as you noted, um, you know, 37,000 people last year traveling to our state to be able to get access to this 
uh, essential health care. Um, we have people who are trying to figure out how to take time off of work. They're trying to figure out who's going to support with child care. Um, how are they going to pay for the procedure? Stigma is a really big barrier that our callers face. Um, we have uh, this highly politicized, highly stigmatized medical procedure um, that now is illegal in certain states. And that means people aren't necessarily talking to their community members, their family, their friends to get support um, with accessing care. And so just stigma itself, not knowing who to go to in your community, who to, who to go to um, for support, I think is just a, a really big barrier too. So what happens? Somebody calls the 800 number, they say they need help. I don't know, let's say they're in uh, Arkansas or Tennessee. Tennessee was a big one uh, on a graphic that I saw the New York Times published that shed all these arrows pointing toward Illinois. What happens next? Um, so, yes, uh, people call us or they um, fill out a, a form on our website. They're matched with one of our incredible support coordinators. Um, we have a really amazing team of um, experts who um provide individualized case management to get people what they need to access care. Um, the support coordinator or one of our volunteer case managers gives that person a call and really starts the conversation with how can we support? What do you need? Um, many times people will need just funding for their procedure, so we'll support with that. Many times people will need support just getting to their the, the clinic location, so we'll support with that. A lot of our callers, I think, need both at this point. Um, many people need logistical support to figure out what um, airline to fly from. Many of our callers are flying for the first time, so they need support with figuring out how to access their boarding pass, how to download um, the uh, the airline's flight information. Same, similar with you know Amtrak or Greyhound. Like, what do I need to be able? What do I need to be able to get where I need to go? Um, they're helping people figure out what clinic is best for them. I think something that independent abortion funds, and particularly the Chicago Abortion Fund, is very very good at is talking to someone who might have an appointment at one clinic three weeks out and saying, wait a second, do you really want to wait for three weeks? Because we can get you into a different clinic this week. We know the waiting times at clinics um, both in Illinois and many around the Midwest and are able to really work alongside our callers to find them the location that works best for them, the clinic that works best for them, um, identify other resources outside of our own that might work best for them. So we work with sibling abortion funds around the country on a regular basis. So we know if you're from Indiana, you are eligible for support, for instance, from the Chicago Abortion Fund and the Hoosier Abortion Fund in Indiana. How can we collaborate with other abortion funds to make sure you have the most support, you have everything you need to get from point A to B. Um, and I think another thing that our, our support coordinators and our volunteer case managers do really well is they talk to the person and um, let them know, you know, we're here for you. If you're not talking to anyone else about this, we can talk to you about it. If you need resources to um, get support around making a decision ab about having an abortion, we can support you with resources for that. So really, we're here to just make sure that we can um, have conversations with folks, get them what they need, and affirm that the difficulty they might be facing in accessing an abortion is not reflective of the morality of that care. Let me take a moment to remind listeners, this is The 21st Show. We are talking about the post Dobbs landscape. Uh, it's been two years, I think, as of yesterday, since the United States Supreme Court ended the constitutional right to abortion that had been laid out in the case of Roe against Wade almost 50 years ago. And we're talking about that with Megan J. Ifo, who is executive director of the Chicago Abortion Fund, a group that helps people uh, financially, logistically, as we've been hearing, come to Illinois or even from within Illinois uh, to get abortion care. 800-222-9455 if you want to join us today. This all sounds very expensive, Megan, I've got to say. And we did get a we got a question from a listener about some of the financial or a comment, I guess, about some of the finances here. Sarah in Champaign says, I have a huge issue that my taxpayer dollars are being used to transport slash reimburse non-Illinois residents and cover their services. That's money Illinois doesn't have to care for women who don't even live here or have a right to vote here. 
I wanted to ask you about that because last summer, Governor Pritzker announced, I think it was $23 million toward a hotline and provider training, among other things. I mean, does, does your organization or, or your peer organizations, do you get money directly from the state? Uh, right now, we do not receive direct funding from the state. Um, we do receive funding from the city of Chicago. The city of Chicago um, supports us with um, $1 million per calendar year that pays directly for exactly what um, your caller uh, wrote in about for abortion care and for wraparound supports. Um, I believe abortion is health care and I believe health care is a right. And I think that we have a responsibility in Illinois to um, support people coming here to access essential life affirming life saving care. And I'm really proud that we can do that in our state. Um, so I, I'm on the opposite side. I think that we should be doing much more to support people. Um, I think it is our duty and our responsibility. Again, I'll remind people that the majority of people who are facing difficulty in accessing abortion care right now are parents, and this is a family issue. And denying a person uh, a wanted abortion creates economic hardship and insecurity, which can last for years. Um, there is a study called the Turnaway Study that was conducted at uh, UCSF, um, and it shows that people and families experience real harm from being denied a wanted abortion. Um, so I think the more that we as Illinois can actually care for people who are forced to come here um, in really, I think, harrowing circumstances and really difficult circumstances, um, I, I think it's it's a it's it's the it's the right thing to do. It's the morally right thing to do, in my opinion. I've seen you talking about, or I've heard you talk about, the financial strain this has been on the fund, having this this significant um, in, influx of people coming to Illinois asking for help. How how has that been? Talk about that for people who haven't heard you talk about that. Yeah, um, we have spent post jobs. We have spent a little over seven million dollars in um, paying directly for procedures and paying for wraparound supports. Um, we are in conversations with all levels of government to be able to support more people, including the state. That's just not something that we have right now. Um, we are really grateful that we have lawmakers in Illinois who um, recognize how important this is and have really um, been incredibly supportive of our work. It is very expensive. Um, people need, on average, uh, about $400 per procedure. That's about how much we spend. That's the average um, per caller. And then it's uh, about over $450 for the wraparound supports they might need. That's a lot of money. Um, and we next month will celebrate five years without turning a single caller away. We're incredibly um, thankful for that. And it is because of supporters here in Illinois and around the country that we've been able to sustain this massive increase in calls and really a huge increase in case complexity as well. You know, I saw a news item this morning that said that the political arm of Planned Parenthood is going to spend $40 million to boost Democratic campaigns for Congress and, and President Biden. Your organization is in need of more money. I wonder if you have a perspective on how people, when they want to give money to support abortion rights, how they are giving that money and to whom? Oh, yeah, that is a, maybe a tricky a, <laughs> a bit of a minefield, I, I gather. But that's a big question. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that um, we are seeing a lot of money being poured into ballot initiatives. As you noted, there's a new hundred million dollar campaign announced yesterday with a lot of national organizations um, that is going to be working on a plan to to get um to get some of these rights back. I think at the Chicago Abortion Fund, we are are we're celebrating 40 years of existence next next year. Um, we existed long before uh, the Dobbs decision um, because Roe was never enough. So, you know, the idea that we even have President Biden yesterday saying like we must restore Roe, um, Roe was not good enough. Roe did not help people get abortions. Legality did not equal access in this country. Um, and I think we, I do think we have a long fight ahead of us, but while we are funding um, these initiatives to um, create legality again, we need to make sure that we are not leaving behind people who are forced to remain pregnant um, because it's, 
politi- politically, you know, um, all right to do so, I guess. We need to see as much investment in abortion funds and getting people the care they need as we do in the ballot initiatives and in long-term strategy. We need a long-term strategy to make sure that people can access ab- access abortion while all of this is happening. All right, we are going to take a break on the show. We'll continue this conversation for a few minutes after we come back. If you want to join us, the number is 800-222-9455. We're going to talk about what uh, what what could lie ahead, depending on how the elections this year go. So Illinois is this blue state. Uh, people who support abortion rights have described it as a haven for the neighboring states. As we said, 37,000 people came here seeking abortions last year. Um, up significantly from before the Dobbs decision ended the constitutional right to an abortion. But could that status for Illinois change depending on what happens in the elections this year and ahead? We're talking about all this with Megan J. Ifo, who is executive director of the Chicago Abortion Fund. Again, if you want to join us, 800 222 9455 is the number. That's 800 222 9455. This is the 21st show. Please stay with us. This is the 21st show. I'm Brian Mackey. We are talking with Megan Jaifo, executive director of the Chicago Abortion Fund, about the landscape after Dobbs, two years after the United States Supreme Court ended the constitutional right to an abortion that a previous version of the court had found in Roe against Wade back in the 1970s. 800-222-9455 if you want to join us today. Megan, I wanted to ask about Illinois' sort of haven status, as as I've heard supporters refer to it. I mean, we're a state that, you know, there used to be Democrats who identified as pro-life here. We had Republican governors for a very long time, although I, I suppose a lot of them would be considered pro, pro-choice pro or pro-abortion rights by, by modern standards where things have gone. But how did we get to be a state that is so different from all of its neighbors in terms of making sure people can get access to abortion care and reproductive health care? Such a great question. Um, I think I can definitely shout out the work of Personal PAC, who has really made it a priority for over 30 years um, to uh, elect um, pro-choice Republicans and Democrats. I just learned last week from my colleague, Sarah Garza Resnick, who's the current CEO, that um, Personal PAC was founded by a Republican woman here in Illinois. Um, and they've done a really great job at um, making sure that we have the protections that we do. And then I think we have a great coalition um, of providers, advocates, and electeds who have um, been able to sustain and I think kind of advance abortion access together as a state. Um, and uh, the impacts are really far reaching. We have been able to sustain these massive influxes in people coming to our state um, with very little wait times, with many resources to help them be able to do so. Um, Illinois is, was the number one um, location where people were, you know, forced, I want to say again, forced to travel to, right? Like this is not, it's, it's great that we've been able to create conditions for people to access care here, but what they are enduring is traumatic and barbaric. I just want to like <laughs> underscore with that. While I'm proud of our state, um, it is a shame that it is like this. But we have we we've worked really hard um, to to create conditions for people to come here, um, and it's been a long road, and it's going to be really important that we continue to work together to sustain it um, because this is an issue that's not going to go away. It's going to take us, I think, a long time to be able to gain back everything that we've lost and more because we believe we need more. Yeah, along these lines, we got a text message from Tony in Peoria who says, get us equal rights, get us bodily authority and autonomy. Good for Illinois, but make sure no one can take it. If if we have in the future a unified federal government committed to advancing anti-abortion laws, what are you most worried about that that could do to access in Illinois? (laughs) 
I think all of it. I'm worried about all of it. Um, I, you know, it's an election year. The outcome of this election is going to be very important. There could be actions that um, if we have a bad outcome um, in the 2024 presidential election that, you know, January, we could see a very different landscape nationally and in Illinois. Um, so I think it's really important for lawmakers here to continue to be um, proactive as we have been and to continue to be as creative as the right is. Um, we have seen a lot of, um, yeah, I don't know what uh, another way to put it other than, you know, uh, creativity and, and very wild um, uh, tactics that they're using. We have medication abortion criminalized in Louisiana. We have Tennessee lawmakers wanting to make it a crime to support people in ac actually getting access to abortion. So we need to make sure we're meeting those um, tactics with with creativity and defense of our own. And I, I think that's really important for our state moving forward. We got a caller uh, who did not want to go on the air, but but Dee Dee from Urbana said supportive of the Chicago Abortion Fund, but had a question in regards to follow up with patients. Wondered if you talk about contraceptives or anything like that to prevent another abortion in the future, as Dee Dee put it. If someone wants to talk to us about contraception or wants us to support with paying for their contraception, we absolutely do do that. Um, but we believe that every person um, needs to make a decision with their physician that's right for them, and that's not our place. Um, so I think, you know, uh, we think that access to contraception in this country should be broad, easy to get, um, free and on demand. And unfortunately, we're seeing Republican lawmakers around the country trying to um, to stop <laughs> access to that very contraception. Um, we saw, you know, Clarence Thomas had a part in the Dobbs um, decision, I believe, that said that contraception may not be um, protected by the Constitution. And that's wild. Like, you know, but but we do believe that people um, should have all the information to make the choices that that are best for them. Do you feel safe doing the work you're doing? And how do you ensure the safety of your people? I noticed on your website, some of those sort of people who appear to be frontline workers are often only listed by first name. Some of them don't have photos or they're wearing masks. How do you ensure the safety of what you're doing? Um, that's a great question. I think that um, we we have security systems in place, um, uh, but I do think that there are certain risks that come with doing this work. Um, and um, it's it's something that we all have to think about every day. We know anti-abortion extremists um, are um, a force to be reckoned with in some instances. And so um, but we, we do have security in place for our, our team. I guess, last question, what what are you keeping an eye on this year? What are you focusing on now? You mentioned the funding challenges. Obviously, the political landscape is important. I'm sure there's just the day-to-day -day work of, of keeping things going. What are you thinking about as, uh, as this year progresses? Yeah, I think right now, this week, we're waiting for a Supreme Court ruling on EMTALA, um, which directly affects our work um, with the CARLA program, which is our complex abortional regional line for access. That is a program we do with the um, state of Illinois, um, Rush, UIC, University of Chicago, and Northwestern that connects people who need hospital-based care to, um, to doctors and to hospitals that can provide that care. Um, we are concerned that if we get a bad ruling and emergency abortion care is no longer protected under EMTALA, it will force people to pay tens of thousands of dollars for life lights and for um, for their procedures here in Illinois. Um, so we are very concerned that we could lose that, um, get that bad ruling this week. Hospital-based care is incredibly expensive. Um, it is uh Currently, 1% of our call volume and over 25% of our budget pays for people to access care in a hospital setting, and um, having a bad ruling would be very difficult. And also, of course, the funding, I think, is a big piece. Again, we know this is not going away. We know costs are going up, and and we know that um, 
we had a new Florida ban that went into effect May 1st. I don't believe we're going to see the full effects of that Florida ban for another couple of weeks, but we do continue to anticipate rising call volume as a result of that ban because Florida was the um, second state behind Illinois in increases um, in people traveling for abortion care. And now we've lost that. And that was a state much of the Deep South was dependent on. And those people will now be forced to come all the way to Illinois for care. Well, as you've, as you've said, this issue is not going away as a, a political issue. Uh, and we will continue talking about it on our program with people with other perspectives later this year. Megan J. Ifo is executive director of the Chicago Abortion Fund. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today on The 21st Show. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it.